Hello, I'm Donna Scale with Roaring Lamps Ministries, along with my co-host Tiffany Ross, and we're excited to bring you A Time to Dream. It's an interview show where you hear real life stories of people who have gone through big things, little things, but all along God was with them and he helped them work through everything. And so we're excited today. Let me ask you a question though. Have you ever been in a crowded room and felt all alone? Does it seem like people that you encounter have their lives all figured out while you're still searching? Do you feel like you just don't fit in? If that's you in any way, then be encouraged as you stay tuned because our guests live through all of that uh, and much of his life with the painful feeling of alienation. But he is here to assure you uh, that you don't have to stay on the outside looking in. A Time to Dream welcomes Marty Earls. Well, thank you, thank you for having me, Donna. And uh, yes. we're Tiffany, yes, yes. Tiffany, and I really appreciate your invitation to come uh, and uh, share my testimony and, and the journey that God's brought me through. Thank you for the opportunity. Great, yes. well, we're looking forward to a wonderful show. Marty and his wife, Melinda, reside in North Texas <clears throat> They've raised three boys and currently have four wonderful, adorable, smart, perfect, perfect <laughs> grandchildren. <laughs> if only we could sell that bottle, it would be great. Unexpectedly called to the ministry later in life, Marty now serves as the family pastor of Royal Haven Church in Farmer's Branch. Uh, despite a recent medical diagnosis, Marty continues to live each day trusting that God knows what's best to hit for him. So your story, Marty, is one to which so many people can relate. Uh, it's feeling like an outsider. Though I'm not a psychologist, it's widely accepted that our childhood greatly affects how we see the world, even into adulthood. Absolutely. So I'm interested to know when and how your feelings of alienation started. Could you tell us what your childhood was like? I don't know, putting it that way sounds so grim, but, uh, but I think it's pretty ubiquitous that we all feel our upbringing was normal, yes. you know, at least until we get a, an adult hindsight on it, you know, and we grow up and whatever we're living in, whatever our situation or our family, uh, that's normal because it's all we know. I did feel like I didn't fit in, but it it wasn't in so much in a Charlie Brown kind of way. It was just more of a, just feeling this was not, you know, I didn't, everybody had the secret and I did, and I don't know what everybody was operating on, what they knew that I didn't know. And, and I just, uh, never a popular kid. I grew up, uh, my dad was in the Navy and, um, which is a good thing. All these things I'm talking about, I look back on it and even at the time, uh, weren't bad things to me. Um, so we moved every three years. Um, uh, that's pretty much at least what used to be a, a typical Navy station. You were stationed somewhere for three years and we would move. So I was born in Millington, Tennessee uh, and uh, moved all over the place. And I lived in Hawaii. Oh, nice. And my mother remarried to a person who was a carpenter, my, Paul, he is my stepfather. Uh, but Paul just kind of means dad to me. So, mm -hmm. um, so uh, Paul um, was a was a carpenter. I moved more after that than I did when we were in the Navy. We moved mm -hmm. all over the place uh, for work, and so, so yeah, I moved a lot. Always the first kid, you know, new kid in school, always making new friends. Uh, so that was, I guess, a little awkward. Uh, I guess I wasn't real confident, uh, but to me, I was just me. You know, so uh, I, I, I'm an introvert uh, as opposed to an extrovert. And, uh, you know, the best definition I've heard of that is what, what that really means is, and I could be very outgoing mm -hmm. uh, and I can be the life of the party, but um, an introvert gains their energy from being alone and getting away from everything. Whereas an extrovert, when they're drained, do they want to get around people and activity and stuff like that. So it's where you draw your energy from. And I draw my energy by getting alone and away from everything. And that's where I feel good and, and gain more energy. So, right. yeah. 
Well, Marty, I know that I've often spoken with a lot of people who have grown up in military families and relocated constantly like you yeah. did. And of course, as adults, they can say, well, it was an adventure, or I learned how mm -hmm. to make friends, and all these things in hindsight, but as a kid, you're living it in real time, and it can be somewhat traumatic to say to your child, okay, up we go again. So this whole concept of home, you know, do you, what was that like for you? Did, did you even feel like you really even had a home growing sure. up? Sure, yeah? absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, home was family. Okay. I'm the youngest of four children, mm -hmm. so I was, you know, pack everything up, get everything going, grab Marty by the hand and let's go. Yeah. And so I just, you know, you could say I had a drug problem. They jarred me everywhere I had to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so, um, yeah, so that was normal. And, and home was wherever my family was. Mm -hmm. So I didn't feel, and I don't have any times where we were driving away and you see in the movies, mm -hmm. you're looking out the yes. back window going, bye, <laughs> you know, I wish we didn't have to leave. Yeah. No, it's like, where are we going now? Okay. I did the, um, uh, the Roaring Lambs testimony workshop, right. which was really good for me. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, and the key takeaway I had, you, one of the things you mentioned, if possible, to have like a, a physical representation that symbolizes yes. your testimony. Well, what I chose during the workshop was a compass. Mm. And uh, because to me, life is a journey. Mm. And it's much less of a map where go here, turn left, go here, do that. It was more of a compass that gives you a direction to go, but how you get there and the obstacles you have to overcome, you gotta figure that out, but you right. have a direction. Right. And so to me, life has always been a journey. I mean, even growing up, going from place to place, finding new new stuff. Uh, I've lived in, uh, by the time I graduated high school, I've lived in eight states, you know? Uh, you know. So I mean, it's just, what's next, what's new? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I don't look back on that sadly, and I don't remember seeing it in a sad way when I was a kid either. Mm -hmm. um, but it does, all those things that you said, oh, I'm very good at walking into a room full of strangers and making myself at home. So I kind of did learn some secrets that I felt like I didn't know, right? You know, that, uh, uh, is that there's really not a secret. Right. A lot of people, even if they, my own children, uh, who are now 30, 32, 34, somewhere around that. Um, they grew up in the same school district, going to the same schools, uh, and I can't even relate to that. Yeah. You know, but they had the same, they can look back and probably go visit their first grade friend <laughs> if they wanted to. Uh, one thing that I know that you learned from all this is the world is not your home. Exactly. That um, ultimately our home is with our family and our real home is in heaven and our real home is with with God, and I'm glad that um, I know you had Jesus early on in your life. Your father was a, a lay pastor at a right. at a point, and so that had to bring you some comfort. My dad grew up in a very devout Christian home. My grandmother, my aunts, he was the only boy, uh, so he was a little bit like me. And my, I'm a lot like my father, um, and kind of head in the clouds, you know, uh, but, um, he, uh, he grew up in a very Christian home, and he went to a seminary for a short time, I think uh, even while he was in the Navy. So he met my mother in Hawaii, uh, and she, her father had moved to Hawaii to, be a, uh, to do some business, and she, she was there, and he was helping with a youth group. Hmm. And she was bringing her younger brother to the youth group hmm. and dropping him off. And that's how they met. So Sweet. he has a history of being involved in ministry and uh, uh, service for the Lord. And, and I'm, I'm, I don't know the history of it, but I know that he gave his life to the Lord at some point and, mm -hmm. and did all the things that their faith did, a baptism or whatever. Um, and when I was four years old, uh, we were stationed in Millington, Tennessee and there's a little town outside of Millington uh, called Stanton. And I have no idea, I was a kid, how he came across it, but there was a little Methodist church that needed a pastor, and so he was a lay pastor. He was not a professional, you know, he'd never finished seminary or anything like that, but they had him to be the pastor at this little church in Stanton, Tennessee. We were there in Millington, which is right outside of Memphis, 
uh, when Martin Luther King was assassinated. Oh, wow. And my brother was at a Boy Scout Jamboree, <clears throat> and they loaded us all up, and we had to go into Memphis uh, to get my brother from the Jamboree, mm. <clears throat> from the Jamboree, and uh, bring him home. I don't remember, nothing bad happened. There wasn't, you know, it wasn't, there was no violence or anything, but it was a scary time for my family, sure. for my parents, but that's about the time we were in Stanton. It was right when everything was happening. And I remember a lot of, a lot of the, some of the civil rights issues spilling over even into Stanton. Mm -hmm. um, um, so uh, interesting time um, to, to be alive and to be in Stanton and outside of Memphis. At that time, when he was in Stanton and being a lay pastor at this church, they would have gatherings of pastors in the region and they would get together, I don't know, once a month or something like that and they'd talk and, and mostly just socialize. And um, so here he is, a young, you know, from hearing him tell me this story, and he told me this story, I didn't know it until I got saved. Mm -hmm. And uh, he told me the story that he was this young, optimistic, naive type of pastor who would was excited to meet with other pastors mm -hmm. and and talk with them about winning souls and, and yeah. guiding your flock and everything like that. But he said that those meetings were horrible. Mm -hmm. He said that the, the other pastors that were there would just talk money, they would talk mm -hmm. you know cynically about things and people. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, he said, I had a breakdown. He says it ended up me standing up on a chair in the middle of one of these meetings berating these gentlemen for you know the way they were talking and, and the way they were talking about this and Good for him. Yeah. we pretty much left soon after mm -hmm. that wow. and um, uh, that was a hard time for him emotionally it was a hard time for him uh, and I don't remember much of that happening mm -hmm. um, but he told me about it later and I think that was probably pivotal mm -hmm. in his leaving the faith mm -hmm. and ultimately that's what happened mm -hmm. um, he uh, throughout the next several years of my growing up uh, we still would go to church we moved back to his hometown in Norman Oklahoma and uh, that's where he was raised and you know I went to church and he would go there and, and, and things like that um, my mother is very devout she loves Jesus very much and uh, but church when I was growing up is very different than how I see and live out church for me today. Mm -hmm. I'd probably be a little bit more of a fanatic or something like that compared to how yeah. we were growing up. <laughs> but yeah. but back in the 60s and, and sure. stuff like that, 70s, even in the 70s, church was the, the foundation. Mm -hmm. It was expected. Right. Everybody had some amount of biblical literacy. Right. Everybody knew the Bible stories and, and when you witness to somebody, you could just kind of start off with God and Jesus, and right. you can't do that anymore right. because you have to go way back. Just does God exist? You have to start beginning right. with yeah. the existence the of God. Yeah. 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 yeah, and we so. see that so much in our society now that that God is is missing, and or we have shut Him out in so many areas. Right. You know, in schools, etc. We could go on and on, and we see the decline. But it is good that you still had that foundation as a young one. And I'm going to fast forward from the little guy ringing the bell, exactly. and the bell taking him up, yep. to years now have passed. You're roughly 19 years old, mm -hmm. and you say that Jesus really revealed himself in a powerful way to you. Would you share with us about Sure. That? Um, again, I've been in and out of church my whole life. Yeah. Sadly, and it's probably my fault, not the church's fault, I don't remember... I didn't know what the gospel was when I was 19. Mm -hmm. I knew Jesus, I knew the Bible, I knew the church and, and things like that. But I, I, what, I, either I didn't pay attention or it wasn't being taught the way that we teach it now, the gospel. If I, I teach children and youth right now and, and if they spend any time with me at all, I want them to know what the gospel is and know that a response is required. Yeah. It's not just something that happens to you because you go to church or because you're in a Christian home or anything like that, but you need to face this question and you need to respond in an affirmative manner to the Lord, to his invitation right. for salvation and forgiveness. Uh, 
But if you haven't done that, you really need to go back in your history and question, okay, do I need to do that now? Because sometimes we just think we're Christians by assimilation or something. Um, so anyway, you were asking me, so when I was 19, I had, uh, boy, when you pick up this story where, where the Lord revealed himself to me, and that's kind of how I always frame it, um, I had run <laughs> really far from the Lord, and I'd been involved in, uh, you know, drugs and alcohol as a kid, you know, and just running around doing the wrong thing, hanging with the wrong people, but I was having a good time, but um, still no purpose. Didn't know, uh, and I'd been to church enough that I looked at that, I looked at church and the things that I had experienced there and said, that's not my answer. And we would sit around and, and talk about God, that God exists. I believe that God, a God existed, but not the God of the Bible. And so what, why are we here? And that became my cry. Why, why am I here? Because I had run my life into the ground. Um, I didn't see any motivation for me to do the things because all I could see was materialism <clears throat> that we get a job so we can buy stuff and that we can you know have a place to live and get a better job so we can buy a bigger place to put more stuff in and and you know I it was a hamster wheel that I did not want to get onto and sitting at the bottom of the barrel where I was uh, I had a little efficiency apartment that overlooked the main street of Norman, Oklahoma. So this was an old building. Uh, my apartment had a window that looked out over the old main street. And I'd sit in that window and just be like, you know, what am I gonna do? What do I wanna do? What's the purpose? Why am I here? Mm -hmm. And I really felt like there was somebody, something out there that had an answer for me. I deserved an answer. Um, I felt in my bones that there was somebody to ask and someone to give an answer to why am I here? Because like we had talked about, I had never really felt at home. Even though I say home is great, I lived a pretty normal life, nothing really bad happened to me, but I didn't fit in. I wasn't, uh, I always felt like there's gotta be more than this. Um, I was picked on, but you know, that wasn't traumatizing. It was just my personality and who I was. And, and uh, but at 19, uh, I just kind of run my life down into the ground and trying to figure out what I wanted to do and what was my motivation for doing it. I wasn't suicidal at all, but I wasn't motivated to live either. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yes. I didn't want to take my life, but what was I doing? Um, had no idea what I wanted to do. And one night in particular, the night, uh, I was, you know, in this efficiency apartment. I'd been sitting in the windowsill looking out over the thing, and I was sitting on my bed and just saying, I need an answer. And it, it really was a prayer, but I didn't know it was a prayer at the mm -hmm. time. But I was literally crying out for my soul, I need to know why I'm here. I need to know the reason for my existence and why I was born because I don't see any path forward uh, that interests me. And it was very, it was a very supernatural experience. The, in, in one moment, my roommate, uh, which is the guy that was just living off with me because he didn't have any other place to go, had said something. He even might have used the Lord's name in vain. He might have even used Jesus' name as a cuss word mm -hmm. or something, but I just heard the name Jesus. For all I know, he didn't say it, but I just, I heard the word Jesus. And it was like a light. All those great, mm -hmm. uh, what's the right word? All of those great uh, uh, things that people always say. Uh, the light came on. My eyes were opened. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, it felt like someone took a cast iron skillet and whacked me upside the head. And warm oil just flowing over me from the top wow. to the bottom. And it was just like my eyes were open. And uh, I do not remember it as an actual visual, someone standing there, but spiritually in my heart, I saw Jesus standing before me. And the first thing he said was, 
this is why you were here. And this is why you were born. And I know this sounds really strange, but it was like a lot of information was just downloaded into my soul. Not that I understood it all or knew what it all was, but when you're having that type of communication with God, it's not like there's an answer, a question, an answer, a question, an answer. It's just like all the questions and answers get brought all together and poof, we're right there. And it was uh, where he just said, you know, I'm the reason you're here. Knowing me is the reason you were born, is the reason you exist. This moment where you recognize who I am and that I love you and, and all these things, just kind of these thoughts were just there. That's why you're here. And all of a sudden, peace, peace. And uh, I was amazed and I was full of joy and I, I understood, this is what I understood at the time. Still didn't know, I couldn't have told you the gospel. I couldn't have said, I'm now saved because Jesus died on the cross and was right. raised again. But it was an introduction, and I knew it was Jesus. It wasn't just a spiritual being. Mm -hmm. It was Jesus. And uh, he said, this is the reason you were born, and this is the reason you exist. Not things you're going to do for me, not that you'll become a pastor in 30 years, or not that you're going to you know, do this or that, but just this right here, this connection, this relationship that began in this instant is why you're here. And I was like, and it was, it was from that day on, I will tell you, and, and I've had ups and downs as a Christian, mm -hmm. and I have uh, strayed, you know, as far as my behavior. I have uh, been unfaithful and interested in other forms of spirituality, but it always came back to Jesus, that I could not ignore what he put into me at that day over the... Main Street of Norman, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And uh, I could never say that that was unreal or I made it up or anything like that. It was, it's been the realest thing in my life. So I used to, I told you, I used to, we used to joke about there is a God, not joke about, say, oh, there's a God, but not the God of the Bible. Well, the very moment that this experience happened, I was immediately drawn to the Bible, God's Word. Don't know why. I just, I had an old 150 year old Bible that was a decoration on my shelf, <laughs> left over from my dad. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it had the yellow crackly pages and things like that. And it, if I wasn't careful, it would have come apart. But immediately I was drawn to that and I would take it down off the shelf. And I'm a person, how do you read a book from beginning to end? So I started in Genesis. I didn't know the difference between. Old and New Testament, I didn't, you know, or anything like that. I just started reading, and I'm telling you, the, the book of Genesis blew my mind. I'd never, I've read the Bible before, I've heard the Bible stories, but now that the Holy Spirit, what I, what I didn't understand then, but I know now, the Holy Spirit had come to reside in me uh, and uh, was just opening up Scripture. Like, uh, I mean, I was like, has nobody ever read this? This is amazing. <laughs> this is amazing. And uh, But from that day forward, I was never alone. That's so cool, your story. Mm -hmm. What happened to you at 19 mm -hmm. happened to me at 28. But I think it happens for everyone. You get to a point in life and you're wanting to know the bigger picture. Sure. Why am I here? What was I designed to do? Who, who am I? And when you start asking those questions, I think God is always faithful to answer them. So for you who are listening today, ask the questions. I've heard it said that when the student is ready, the teacher appears. <laughs> and uh, it's true it's with true. God. When you are ready, God will appear. He may not appear the same way to you that he appeared to Marty, but he will answer your yeah. question when you sincerely ask him to reveal himself to you. He will reveal himself to you in some unique way, but he will always ask that. And what the cool thing is, when God comes into your life, he makes you a new creation. Yes. You're not the same person that you were before. And I, and I know he changed different. you. I, yeah. My whole perspective 
the way I viewed everything from that moment on was completely different than how I'd seen it. Um, from then on, from that day forward, uh, I was working at a Taco Mayo, okay? Horrible job by all standards. <laughs> yeah. But I was food. happy <laughs> because me and Jesus went to go work our shift. Yeah. And this is how I felt. I still yes. wasn't in church. Right. Still hadn't been. I, I, I used to say that I, I almost kind of came to the Lord in a vacuum, but I didn't because there's always your history. There's always mm -hmm. the past, yeah. you know, and, and all these things. But it was me and Jesus going to work me and Jesus walking down the street. Mm -hmm. When I lost my job at Taco Mayo, well, it was hilarious because I didn't do anything to get fired for, but they had to pin, you know, and so I got fired, I lost my job, and I was just like, okay, Jesus, what are we gonna do now? Uh, you know, right, okay. and I knew I didn't done anything wrong, and right. so I was like, huh, well this is, so when I run into these situations, and this, this is throughout my life, huh, look what just happened to me. Mm -hmm. I should be wailing and crying and shaking my fist at somebody. Uh, but it was just like, oh, okay, Jesus. Well, obviously you have another plan. What are we going to do? That's exactly how I felt. And so we, me and Jesus went and applied for some other jobs and got a job at a hospital and uh, as a, in housekeeping. And that's where I met uh, my first Christians. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. And, and he led me to people. And up until that point, I'll be honest with you, I felt like I was the only one in the world that had ever experienced this. I didn't, good or bad, I didn't feel like I had just joined the church and now I'm a Christian and now I've, uh, you know, should go find a church. I was led to the Bible. I wasn't drawn to go to church. Not for whatever reason. I'm not saying that's, that's not a judgment on church. It's just, I found Jesus. He gave me his word and it was me, me and him. And then he introduced me to some Christians who also didn't just go to church, but they knew him. Right. And so we became friends and we would meet and we would watch, uh, you know, like a, 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 a popular evangelist at the time. We'd gather on Thursday night and we would go and we'd watch this guy preach and we'd be like, that was great. And um, so we had this friendship and eventually I got involved in a church and uh, it was a surprise a more of a like a college age church where the preacher wore a you know a hawaiian shirt and <laughs> jeans and you know and that sort of thing so that's what i kind of was birthed into so to speak yeah. and i've kind of held that in my own life since but uh non-traditional type of church mm -hmm. uh, very much about relationships very much about that so regardless of my journey after that um you know I eventually found my way into church, and uh, and that was both good and bad, you know, um, because when you get church, which is wonderful, um, you also get the traditions and the politics and the the right. the person on person relationships that have so many problems and things like that, uh, or agendas mm -hmm. and things like yeah. that. And what I was living previous to that was this pure relationship. Right. But God wasn't going to leave me there. He said, you need to be a part of the body. You need to be a part of the church. You need to find other believers. Uh, and so uh, he did leave me there. And that's been probably my bigger struggle is kind of church and church ways and what I feel in my heart. And, uh, uh, and I used to think words like doctrine and... Um, um, theology or um, tradition, these were all bad to me. As I get older and more mature mm -hmm. and the Lord brings me along, I realize how important doctrine is. I realize how important theology is. I, you know, it, it, Christianity, uh, a relationship with Jesus can very much be and should be a pure relationship, a one-on-one -on -one relationship. But it doesn't exist in a vacuum. And He does call us to be together. And there's always going to be things. Right, because church is a hospital for sinners. Absolutely. It's not a place for all the saints. It's real people. Mm -hmm. And people can disappoint you. Yeah. And uh, the relationship with Christ is personal. Yes. And, um, but the church is a place where you don't know how many people grew in their faith because of you. Seeing your exactly. faith. And so even though you might not have received as much from church, you had no idea how much you were giving. 
at church right. to other people. Sure. Now that's about you're about nineteen, you're about twenty, and 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 you meet a woman, right? I did. And at the next stage of your life, tell us about okay, that. Okay, I got married. Um, uh, I saw her singing in church. Mm -hmm. Okay, and she sang beautifully, and and all those things. And uh, I was young and wanted to just move on, and and uh, I married this lady. Um, this just to make sure we know where we're going. This marriage ended in divorce mm -hmm. after about seven years mm -hmm. uh, and two children. Um, there were uh, there were issues with. Um, some psychiatric issues involved. There was no infidelity or anything mm -hmm. like that. Uh, she had told me, even as things were good, not you know that uh, we came to a point in our marriage about five years in where she told me she didn't love me, never had, and was really just accepted my my proposal after three times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she turned me down twice, and then. Uh, after like the third time, uh, she said yes, but she told me later on that that was probably to, you know, to get her out of the situation she was in, which is not a good situation. Mm -hmm. And I was a safe person. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not very threatening. I'm not very, uh, you know, aggressive or anything. So she felt safe with me, and we got married, and we had two wonderful kids. And and uh, uh, over time, uh, she just was didn't want to be with me. And so, uh, long story, cut very short, after a separation where she had taken the children to her parents on the East Coast, uh, she came back, kind of like my own little story when my dad Hi. came back, uh, and, then, um, and then she decided to leave again after a couple more years, and, uh, but I said, I'm, I need to keep the kids. And so, I was a single dad, full-time single dad, uh, and we moved to uh, Garland, Texas, where my brother lived. Um, and we, uh, we moved here. Uh, that was a, maybe our listeners, maybe your listeners can, can relate to something like this. There were no bad people in this situation. She was not a bad person. I was not the bad person. Um, and she was not happy and she wanted to leave. And I was not a warden. So mm -hmm. you're, that's what you want to do, then mm -hmm. that's what you do. Um, and even though I knew at the time I was in a loveless marriage, or at least she didn't love me, and, and as much as I would work and work and work to make that person love me, um, doing everything I could to, you know, I, I guess I, I, I can run into that situation where I see somebody for their potential, not for what they are, and think that if, and what I thought in this first marriage was that if I just loved her enough, if she experienced real love, unconditional love, that she would be able to come out of that place and accept that love and, and flower to bloom or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I thought. I mean, not kind of, that is exactly what I thought. But when that didn't happen um, and she wanted to leave, even though I, I had resigned myself to be in a loveless marriage, someone that didn't want to be with me, when she left, there was a, a huge weight lifted off, but at the same time, there was grief mm -hmm. because it was something that you had put your whole heart and life and effort into. Mm -hmm. And even if that was a good thing, and I do believe it was a good thing, um, and that might be controversial for some people, but we could do another show on that, um, that there was also grief and loss. So we moved to Norman, uh, uh, Garland, Texas. This is where I live now. And um, I was a single dad for a couple years. I was a single dad and uh, it really hurt my faith a lot. It, mm -hmm. it really made me, again, lose motivation. Uh, that my motivation at that point was my kids. Uh, because when you spend that amount of time in a, a very difficult marriage, that has a lot of effects on your faith yes. too. Mm -hmm. uh, and that can suck your energy and that can steal your hope and your joy. Uh, and I let it, I, I don't think it has to let, but mm -hmm. I let it. And so when I got out of that marriage, I was 
thinking freedom from all types of stuff, even my religion and my faith. But God never really let me go. He never really let me get very far. And that's where I have hope for my father mm -hmm. who left the faith. Because even when we run and we think I'm going to find my answers elsewhere, Jesus never let me go. Mm -hmm. And um, so for two years struggling, making basically minimum wage, trying to raise two kids. Mm -hmm. uh, single moms out there, I get it. I know. Because mm -hmm. um, being a single dad wasn't any easier. And uh, I had some family help, which not some. My sister, who had recently gone through a divorce, we moved in together. She had three kids. I had two. So we worked opposite shifts, oh, wow. took care of each other's kids when we were not working, and uh, uh, and just made it happen, made it work, kept food on the table, kept, mm -hmm. you know, but it was hard. Mm -hmm. I, I look back and I go, I can't believe I made it through that time. Um, but, you know, I think we do that. That's the old footprints thing, right? right? You look right. back and you go, I really felt like <laughs> I was alone, but I wasn't, right? right? right. And God was always with me, and I see that. I mean, so much of our Christianity is hindsight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is, right. Well, Marty, I can relate uh, vicariously a bit because my husband, I am his second wife. Okay. And he speaks about when he was really struggling in his job and trying to parent his boys. Now, he, they did the back and forth, mm -hmm. but he would go to the dollar store and eat chili during the week so he could get his boys the cereal that they really wanted, right? right. Oh, so all of that kind of stuff. Absolutely. So that said, I am so grateful um, that God is a redemptive God. Mm -hmm. And in this journey, he doesn't just say, well, you blew it there, and that's it. You know, he gives us so much that grace. You so, so much mercy. Thank you, God. And so <laughs> I know that no marriage is perfect, but would you share with us about Melinda, how you all sure. met? Sure. That's a lot easier to <laughs> say. Uh, so... Single parenting, uh, my boys, it was time for them to go to school. Uh, so we went to a elementary school and I enrolled them. And uh, my future wife was the teacher's assistant of my younger son. And uh, uh, some of the other teachers at the school set us up because I was, I was a lot skinnier then. I was, <laughs> I was a lot better looking then. And uh, I was bringing, bringing my boys to, to school and picking them up and doing all that. And pick, you know, so I think the way I know now how teachers talk, um, I'm sure that they saw me picking up five mm -hmm. kids or my sister picking up five kids or, you know, as a, how we would juggle that. Uh, and so I'm sure there was a little bit of a reputation of that guy is, you know, da, 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 you know, but they fixed me up with my wife and we went on a date in November of 1994, right after Thanksgiving. I think it was the day after Thanksgiving. And, um, and then we never looked back. Six months later, we got married mm -hmm. and she had a, a wonderful young, he was a now a wonderful man, a wonderful young boy. Uh, and uh, he was older than my boys. So uh, we, uh, we started dating and once you've had kids and been married, there's not a lot of games to play. Right. Mm -hmm. So we figured out pretty quick that this was what we wanted. And she was uh, very strong in her faith and where I had been kind of estranged from the mm -hmm. Lord a bit and now kind of coming around. And uh, her love and her faithfulness to God uh, brought me right back in. Mm -hmm. I mean, it didn't take long, you know, for me to go, okay, God, I get it, okay. <laughs> and uh, we started going to church together, her church, and, and all the where she grew up and everything, uh, and we blended our families. And we really believed that that was God's call in our life, is to blend this family. Um, we were, you could call it somewhat fortunate for us that um, my spouse was, my ex-spouse was on another coast, and hers mm -hmm. was not in the picture at all. Uh, and so we, there wasn't kids going away every other weekend and all that sort of stuff. It was, it was us and we were together. Uh, and uh, blend, we love having ministry with blended, other blended families. Mm -hmm. When we get couples that are coming yes. together and doing that, we love talking to them because we feel we have a wealth of knowledge <laughs> about blending families. And you know, one of the things we tell people right away is 
you got to make each other number one. Even though we love our children, you've got to make each other number one. And you need to be united, mm -hmm. even when it's not comfortable, because you probably parented differently. Uh, you need to not allow children to play you off one another. Um, and I see it. Yeah, yes. you, you need to, um, if you, if I had a problem the way she disciplined something and we were all together, I would just back her up no matter what. And then we'd go back to the bedroom later and I go, you know, we might have been able to handle it a little differently or she, you know, she might fresh, you know, express her frustration of how I dealt with something. Uh, but we did that in private. Uh, we didn't undercut each other. And um, it was important for our children for their boundaries to be set. We all need boundaries, but especially children have to have boundaries and uh, because otherwise they're gonna go try and find where the boundaries are. And if you don't have the boundaries right in close, they're gonna keep going until they hit a boundary. And uh, so we uh, really encourage them to stay together on, the, on everything. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, so, I don't know successful or not. I believe we were extremely successful. I have a great relationship with our oldest. Mm -hmm. And we, most people, had, there's people that have known us for years that didn't know that we were a blended family. That's cool. Um, and I, I take some pride in that. Or, right. or they go, oh, Seth's name is different. Hmm. You know, or whatever. And that's a, that's a clue right there. But, but um, uh, a lot of people just assume they're, or someone would say our oldest, he looks just like you. They go, thank you. You know, it's, you know, funny things like that. Uh, so yes, uh, blending blending our families was our calling at that time, and it was a difficult calling. It was not easy, and it took a lot of sacrifice, a lot of compromise, mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, yeah, it really did. So Marty, your story is just so varied, and we love it. It's just <laughs> it's wonderful to just sit and talk with you about how God's worked in your life. Um, one uh, part of your story is job loss. Would you speak to our listeners about that sure. and what God showed you through that? Um, like I said, I wasn't making much money. I was working minimum wage when I met Melinda, and we both just kind of struggled financially. Uh, and uh, God eventually led me to a, a great job with uh, a telecommunications company, uh, which provided not lots of money, but a lot more money than we had previous. Mm -hmm. And it allowed me to work one job, because previous to that I was working a couple, three jobs or something, whatever I had to do to make ends meet. And um, uh, so I had one job that gave us stability, and we were able to raise our kids, the very youngest, graduating high school in, in 2009 and in 2010, I was laid off mm -hmm. and during the, the big yes. mm -hmm. 2008 crash and everything that was going on. Our company was tanking and all sorts of things going on, people getting laid off left and right. Uh, and that was a very important time. Again, my theme in my testimony is a journey, okay? So I see in this, again, just like losing my job at Taco Mayo or loss of a marriage or things that, that happen in life is just, I was able to take it as this is just the journey God's got me on. Um, so, okay, now Jesus, what are we gonna do now? And so in 2010, I was laid off and I had seen, I don't know, when it comes to hard things, bad things happening in life, I think this is uh, the cause of suffering or what do we do with suffering? is probably one of the toughest things for people to deal with in the Christian faith. Personally, I think a lot of that is because we're selling something that is not Christianity. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. suffering is part of our life. It is part of the journey and it sh we shouldn't be surprised when things go wrong. But as Christians, we're so often taught even if it's not taught verbatim from the pulpit, it's something we assimilate right. out of church that, uh, and actually I had been, in, okay, so not to, I don't want to go back. So the whole thing is that when bad things happen, where is God in all of this? Mm -hmm. I'm a Christian. I'm doing my best. God, why did you let this happen to me? The old 
why me? I've just never had that because I felt from the beginning, you know, this, this thing, I understand it, but I also feel like I have no right to say, hey God, what, what's, this, what's the problem here? Because when he came to me at 19, mm -hmm. I became his. Everything about my life became his. All decisions, everything falls under submission to him. And so that means everything that happens to me mm -hmm. is a part of my journey with him. And I don't question it. I just say, what are we going to do? It doesn't mean if I get sick, I don't take medicine. Mm -hmm. I don't pray to be healed. It doesn't mean if I lose my job, I don't pray, oh, God, help me find another job or what, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I, not that I have the answers. I just know that he's with me mm -hmm. no matter what. So instead of being shocked, we understand that these things are part of life. So in 2010, I was laid off. And I'm like, well, thanks, Jesus, that that job happened to provide for my children to get through high school and graduated. Now it's just me and my wife technically so we could go live in a cardboard box and be okay if I have children I don't want to do that uh, but you know so we can do whatever we need to do Lord but what do you want me to do and um, separately in, in my prayers and my thoughts I'm thinking okay God you know let me I feel like I should go into ministry because I, I it was a it was a running joke that my job for the telecommunications company uh, was uh, to support my ministry no my job the decent pay was to support my ministry habit yeah. at church because i'd been yeah. doing children's church yeah, and sure. helping with youth and doing all the things that a very involved church member does you know and in all the different areas and what do you need me to do i'll do it uh, but i ran the i was a children's church director for many years and you know so i felt like my job supported my ministry habit well now i'm laid off it's like, God, what do you want me to do? And I kind of felt like he was just saying, it's time uh, to do this. But I didn't want to do that to my wife. <laughs> you know, because that was going to be a, a huge drop in pay. It was going to be, you know, going back to school and all these things. And, and so I was saying, okay, well, i got to go back to school, Melinda. Maybe I could do graphic design or something like that. that will make a good living. And she goes, you just need to go into ministry. Thank you, Melinda. <laughs> <laughs> and I said... She goes, that's been our dream. It's been our dream for a long time. And I said, I know, but you know, I'm not going to, you know, wow, well, here's all the things that, why we shouldn't. Here's the money reasons. Here's the time reasons. Here's all this. And she, you know, so, yeah, she, and I said, well, that's why I felt God telling me. I just didn't want to, like, put you into that. But you know? she confirmed it. Oh, yes, yeah, she did. I do want to um, let the audience know that everything isn't always rosy. Just mm -hmm. because you're a follower of Christ, and Not I know even right now you're dealing with uh, health Stage issues. Stage three mo uh, metastatic melanoma. Mm -hmm. As my doctor said, if you get cancer, this is not the kind you want. Mm -hmm. That that has been just the same thing for me. Okay, right. God, what are we going to do now? Mm -hmm. Who can I reach yeah. on this journey? I mean, yeah. You know, what what? How does this play into my story? When I went through the Roaring Lambs testimony. Um, uh, Workshop. workshop, thank you. That's the word. I, I said it right the first time. The workshop that we went through on how to give our testimony and and, and how to think about it. Two things, uh, a lot of things stuck out to me. A lot of things stayed with me, but two things in particular. Uh, one is you, you had us kind of pick a symbol for our testimony. Uh, and like I mentioned in my testimony earlier, uh, I chose a compass um, because I, I think a compass is that, that God gives us our direction of where we need to go but we don't know the geography of what we're going to have to go through to get there okay so the compass to me is, is very important and the second thing uh, I'll share with you that has stuck with me over all the time uh, you came into the workshop and, and you said the testimony it, it's not about you and you said I want you to imagine that Jesus were sit was sitting in the audience where you gave your testimony and he's just listening intently to the story that you're telling. And he's just waiting for you to say, I can't wait till you get to tell him about me. And, and I'm like, yeah, that's the point of my testimony. I can't wait till I get to tell people about Jesus and how he entered into this story. Um, and so thank you for those things that I learned in the workshop. They were wonderful. 
that's become my passion, is to let people understand this is part of the journey, okay? This is, having doubts doesn't scare God. It, matter of fact, he wants you to ask the hard questions. Um, not understanding something is okay, okay? Uh, we can learn, we can read, we can listen to sermons, and we can write notes, and we can be able to give that same advice that we got from somebody to somebody else. But until the Holy Spirit puts something in you, that's when it becomes really embedded into who you are. The cancer diagnosis was not a revelation of anything to me. This has been something that God has built into me over time. So my definition of a blessing, and I've taught this for years, is anything in my life, anything that comes into my life that brings me closer to Christ. So here's what most people end up thinking, is that when something bad, and, and we'll use my cancer diagnosis as an example, about uh, a month or two ago, I was diagnosed with stage three metastatic melanoma. And my uh, dermatologist, who brought back the lab report, told me, he says, if you get cancer, this is not the kind that you want. He said, it's very aggressive. Uh, praise the Lord, there are treatments now that weren't available 10 years ago that are very effective. So, uh, but as this happens and he tells me this, I can either say, well, hey, I'm a pastor. I'm a, I'm a good Christian. I'm, I'm trying to live my life for the Lord as best as I can. So either God has failed me or I've failed him. Why do I have this cancer? Why did I lose my job? Why did my marriage fail? Something must be wrong with me that God let that happen to me. Or something must be wrong with God. And to be honest, most of us are going to just say it's me, not God. But we can blame God. I think we have all run into people who blame God for the death of a parent or a loved one. And they become bitter and hardened because of that. Uh, so, you know, for most of it, it's easier to just say, God must not be happy with me or I wouldn't have cancer. Or I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying for healing, and it doesn't come. When bad things happen, it doesn't mean something's wrong with me. And it doesn't, it certainly doesn't mean something's wrong with God. It's just life. Because the truly good news is that Jesus is with me through every bit of it. Mm -hmm. And just like when I was a new Christian, we would, I would say, okay, Jesus, let's go to work now. Okay, Jesus, let's do that. I don't think that's ever left me. I may have you know, when they say, if, if you find yourself far away from God, it's you that's moved, not God. Okay, so there's been times where I've wandered off down the path and gone, God, where are you? And, and why didn't you stay with me? No, you left me. But the truth is, he never leaves us. You know, and that's the other scriptures. How many times does the Bible say, give thanks in all situations and for all things? Mm -hmm. I can look at that camera and talk to your listeners and say, I thank God for my cancer. If I'm healed, I thank him. And if I'm not healed, I thank him. Because he is drawing me in this time where I realize my mortality even more than I ever have. When I understand that I could lose family, that I could lose friends. Uh, as sad as that is, I know that he's with me and it help, has helped me to appreciate the things that I have. Uh, I have not been sad through any of this and that's not a pat on the back for me. It's, it's a thank you, Jesus because I know no matter what I go through, you're there for me. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if the gospel someone is preaching is not applicable in any country, in any community, in any culture, uh, in any socioeconomic, if you can't preach the same gospel to rich people and people in poverty, then you're teaching, you're preaching the wrong gospel. It is not a new religion. It is a it is an invitation to leave religion behind and enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ. So if you found that religion has failed you, you're in good company. If you have found that you have failed yourself, you're definitely in good company. If you would like to have a relationship with a God who loves you so much that he proved it 2,000 years ago, he proved it first by creating you and he proved it again by sending Christ to die for you, no matter what you've done. All he asks is that you trust him. Trust that what he has done for you on the cross 
is all that you need. And he will forgive you of your sins, which is important because our sins are what separate us from having a relationship with him. And that relationship does not have to be perfect. It can be just as messy as life is. But he loves you, regardless of how well you fight the battles and how much you win or lose. All you have to do is say, God, I hear this message. I need this. I, I want to have a relationship with you, but I thought I was the problem. Or I thought you didn't care. Or whatever your experience has been with other Christians or a church or just in your life, period. Those things all fall away. And it comes down to you and Jesus. And there's nothing that stops that from happening except your unwillingness to accept what he's done for you. So I ask just a simple, heartfelt prayer. Doesn't have to be any special words. There's no magic formula here. Just say, I need you. I need you, Lord. Please forgive me. I want to learn more about your death on the cross. I want to learn more about what you've done for me. Oh. We'd love to know that you made the decision to join the family of God and receive Jesus as a free gift uh, of salvation. Best thing Email us at a time to dream at gmail.com. You can call us at 972-380-0123. We'd love to pray with you and for you. So let us know how we can do that. And thank you for listening to A Time to Dream. I'm Donna Scale of Roaring Lamps Ministries, along with Tiffany Ross, my co-host. And we've enjoyed this time with yes. Marty Earl. Thank you, thank you for listening. <laughs>